good evening. Um, th th there are some changes to the panel for this session. Um, we are um, joined by, if I can start from my left, um, but Nico Paul, who is the founder and principal of Pollock's Properties. And we have Professor Mailing, who is one of the distinguished members of the Indonesian Academy of Sciences, which is a highly reputable uh, organization. And we have Wan Zaleha from Orbit Ventura and Berkaria Indonesia, which is a, uh, a new initiative between Zaleha and Pa Ilham Habibi. And uh, so what I'm going to do today, given that there is a little bit of a change to the, to the panel members, so whatever that we had planned is no longer applicable. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of overview. Um, we, I'm from Tusk Advisory. We are strategic advisors in infrastructure and we've been one of the uh, I guess uh, long-term advisors to the government of Indonesia in developing infrastructure. The current um, progress in infrastructure compared to the last 10 years where there was a lot of discussion about spending money on infrastructure but not much really happened. But in the last three years, as of now, there's over 72 billion US dollars of infrastructure is currently under construction. Now that is unprecedented. That level of infrastructure spend for any country is going to lead to significant growth, not only in economy, therefore, and also in terms of employment, in terms of trade, as well as reducing the cost of logistics, etc. Now, fundamentally, such level of growth, and given what you've been hearing for the last two days, in 13 years' time, 2030, even before we hit the target of 2045, we will be fifth largest economy in the world at a GDP that is at least three to four times the current size. Now that level of GDP growth cannot be achieved with the people of the country, the citizens of the country contributing to its economic growth and participating, not being bystanders of the economic growth. So I'd like to start with Professor Mailing, who has been one of the pioneers in promoting the need for better human capital growth in the country. So perhaps, Professor Mailing, if I can start with you, just an overview of your ideas and what you think the country should be doing in terms of how do we improve our human capital to be able to participate, not be bystanders of an economic growth. Thanks also to the organizers for inviting me, especially KSI asked me to participate today. I guess they're one of the supporters of this event. Uh, I have worked on a book which took also the title. When I started it, uh, it wasn't that much in folk, but today all I hear is about disruption, disruption, disruption. And that's also uh, the thoughts that I have, that I would like to uh, inform, especially where I come from. I, besides being a member of the Indonesian Academy, even with my white hair, <laughs> I've been retired uh, several years ago, supposedly. But I still teach at the University of Indonesia, the Faculty of Economics there. Uh, and the reason I took this stance of the watch out for the disruption in universities is that I feel, yes, uh, my training, my original um, post-secondary education training was in sociology and then I continued into demography. So a very heavy focus on 
the people, what happens to the people, and what should we do about it. Now, uh, in the education field, as a sociologist, I do realize, you know, of all that has been discussed during these two days, especially today at uh, these days with the fourth industrial revolution as we're coming, is it peaking? I'm not sure. It's probably going to uh, increase in speed, much uh, heavier and much, um, much more, uh, with a greater impact on society. That will definitely be true. And I feel that teaching at the university, the universities worldwide, but in Indonesia too, to me are too traditional. You know, you have so many, too many smart people there. They will always argue and don't make decisions in the end. Yet we are at the brink of having to change what we are doing. Like we've heard, universities until today, many of them are still very conventional in their practices. What they, the way they teach is still very conventional. Yes, we are making changes at the edges only. Because, of course, if we make drastic changes, it's the lives of many people that will be affected. It's the lives of the teaching staff. The teaching staff will have to change. And this is very difficult for us because um, I'm at the University of Indonesia, which is a state school, which means we're uh, I'm no longer there, of course, but the teaching staff are pegawai uh, negeri, civil servants, supposedly. So it's you can't fire them, <laughs> and but yet if they object to change, it's also difficult to get them to change. So this is the dilemma that the university faces. And yet, if we want to be part of the world, in uh, Indonesian universities are also uh, affected by worldwide movements, a global movement. Yes, we have to be there, part of the world. So what do we do? We are very busy making sure that we get uh, that we get noted. So what do we do? We join all the worldwide university institutions to get ranked in the global system. So with that. Uh, it's all, uh, still a lot of changes are happening, but very slow and at the edges. I, uh, in my book that I published a few months ago, I called it the era of disruption. What is going to happen? We've heard what's happening in, uh, in Australia, but uh, is, in, uh, should, uh, is or should Australia be a model for Indonesia? I am not sure. Of course, what I like to hope, what I don't think has been mentioned, also not by the vice governor, is that in, in the end, you know, um, so far in Indonesia, if you look at our government structure, Education is considered a gift of government to the people because it's their right. It's more, it's treated more as a social issue rather than an economic factor to drive uh, development. Okay, so yes, make it available. So if the government makes it available, it's a supply side. Uh, the, Policies are very much supply side driven. So what do you do? If you want to increase education, you make available more, uh, more schools. That's what you do. But no, there is no word about um, excellence, about competition that we're going to have to compete in the world, uh, that we have to produce. You know, If you want to be an innovator, you have to be on top, not you know, one of the masses. So uh, it's standardization is still very often practiced. So this is what uh, I feel requires changes. Um, I said to Mr. Gannon, my dream would be, what if education is not just regarded as a social tool to improve the well-being of people by, you know, learning for learning's sake, 
but rather as an economic tool. In that sense, uh, at the macro government public policy level, what I wish to see is that edu higher education at least, right now our ministry is called the Ministry of Higher Education and Research that they be shifted from uh, human development to the economic, uh, the coordinating minister for economic development. And that is our Th <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Professor Melling. So effectively what you're saying is the, uh, and which is the key point, that education is not just a social issue, but rather going forward, more and more it will become an economic issue, and which is one of the, I guess, the, the theme of this particular session in terms of connecting the dot for the economic growth of the country, we need to bring the, the education level to become an economic factor because that then brings the people to be able to contribute meaningfully to the economic growth. So if, if that's a good rejoinder to perhaps uh, but Nico, um, given what you are doing within your property firm in terms of developing your um, center for um, technology uh, to increase research and development in, in the area of education and education related property development, perhaps if you can give us a little bit of insights into what is it that you're doing and what was the motivation behind this? Thank you. Thank you, Raj. I think the word innovation is a very important word in property developments today. We are forced to innovate in the way we develop our real estate projects so that we keep our growth in the right uh, momentum and to also satisfy the need of today's uh, millennials who has a very different requirements in terms of their choice of properties. So one of the samples that I would like to share in uh, today's uh, forum would be, we have started to develop a new concept, what we call as the satellite uh, CBD, we felt that this satellite CBD is a very important type of developments in order to drive innovations in the economy, to connect the dots from various industries to be able to sit together, to be able to meet together. We have one development in Karawang, we called it as Polax. Technopolis. This is a 42 hectares developments. It is approximately about 3 million square meters of developments. What we've done is that we are incorporating a very important aspect in today's economy, which Professor Mailing has discussed earlier, education. Education, which is a driving force of the economy. So, we would have a university in the CBD as a component, a very important component of the development. Secondly, we also have to incorporate medical facilities as well as research and development parks to encourage bigger firms to set up their techno parks here in these satellite CBDs in order for people who live there to be able to, to work, to live, to play in one big ecosystem. I think as a property developer, this is one of the ways that uh, we have started to innovate in order to increase growth and also in order to encourage more innovations which would be a value add to the economy. Also, we were looking at in the next 15 years, I think Indonesia would be the fifth largest economy in the world. 
we have to prepare ourselves so that we have the right proper infrastructure to be able to compete with our neighboring countries. I think we've been uh, collaborating with Berkaria, Indonesia, with Ibuzi here, in order to attract more companies to set up establishment in our Polak Technopolis in Kerawang. As you know, Kerawang is a little bit remote from Jakarta, but the government is building big infrastructure. They are building the elevated toll roads. They are building the high-speed Jakarta-Bandung train stations. And the Kertajati Airport, I think, will be operational by next year. So uh, I felt for property developers, it's very important for all of us to innovate into developing integrated mixed-use ultra-large-scale developments because this is the requirement of today's economy and if we were to compete well with what our neighboring countries has done, I think this is something which the government has to support by way of making licenses uh, easier as well. And you can see that this type of infrastructure would definitely benefit the economy overall. Yeah. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. In fact, um, part of our, our work with the government, we recently interviewed the coordinating minister for economic affairs in terms of the, the, the current government's programs, their achievements, etc. And what was interesting in terms of the four pillars that I mentioned that the current government's focus is, one is of course infrastructure as, as you mentioned, but Nico, you know, the, the, the amount of infrastructure spend that is currently going on is extensive and our estimate is this current $72 billion that's under construction, which is expected to be completed around 2019, 2020, will add over 2% to the GDP. So the, 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 by 2020, we will go from 5% GDP growth to 7%, and that's considerable uh, impact to the economy. And as Nico said, you know, one of the key aspects that, you know, both the private sector as well as the, the tertiary institutions are looking for is how do we bring the people along to, to benefit from that. So when we interviewed Dr. Damin Nasution, one of the things that he mentioned within Indonesia, there have been in the last two to three years, they've been focusing in enabling landowners to be certified. Last year alone, over 600,000 land certificates were issued. This year, the target is over 5 million land certificates will be issued. This enables the landowners to become and to enter the formal economy. So people who previously that will be in the informal economy because they're not able to show a piece of paper that they own assets, now they can be part of the formal economy by sh going to the banks and ge generate borrowings, etc. So I want to come to Ponzaleja. One of the, your area that you've been very active in terms of doing Indonesia Berkaria is to help smallholders, to help people who are being able to make things, to actually make things and bring it to the market. So uh, how do you see what you've been doing so far? in terms of helping people to participate in the growth of the economy and what are your strategies going forward? Thank you very much. Um, I come from um, Berkara, Indonesia, which is a movement uh, also facilitated by Habibi Festival and other activations and Berkara, Indonesia has a belief uh, 
a uh, tagline, if you like, of a philosophy of Mambudayakan technology, or to make technology part of culture. And our program generally has uh, a uh, trajectory of starting from ideation and prototyping right up to industrialization with commercialization and um, all the things that you have to happen in between. Where I come from, I am a proponent of the beginning which is uh, the, the ideation and prototyping. I come from the part where you have to empower uh, the people of you and me, not, not before they even become SMEs. I don't know if you're familiar with that very um, uh, famous picture of the goldfish bowl, and there's a lot of goldfish in the bowl, and there's one goldfish jumping out. And that's the one that everyone focuses on, is that goldfish jumping out. That's, you know, that's the Zuckerberg, that's the, the Gojek, and that's the Tokopedia. And, and what we'd like to look at, and what we're concentrating on for one part of Bukhara, Indonesia, is the other goldfish. Because we feel that there's a lot of potential that's not being tapped. And a lot more innovation can come from there. Because when we talk to startups, and, and um, we find that they get stuck somewhere in the middle from, uh, they, they can't go forward, people win competitions, or they're not producing products that people need, and a whole host of challenges. So we need to actually uh, seed the base and empower the base. And we're doing this through one of the ways, I'll just briefly talk about what we mean by the maker's movement. The maker's movement grew out of a, a DIY uh, ethic. Uh, now it's become a do it yourself, do it together, do it with others. But essentially, it's about democratizing production and democratizing innovation. Imagine if you and me, we could walk into a facility where we have access to tools. This is the other thing, the tools revolution. This is more of a hardware revolution than a software, but we could have access to 3D printers. How many people in the room have heard of 3D printers? What are they? 3D printers, anyone? Very few. They're these uh, fabricating machines that could pretty much print anything you want on the spot. If you can imagine it, it can be printed. So you have access to 3D printers, laser cutters, milling machines, CNCs. Uh, you have access to Raspberry Pis. It's a microprocessor. Arduinos is a microcontroller. What it means is you can learn how to make things move, uh, light up. Technology right now to a lot of people is um, a bit distant. Oh, I'm not, I'm not that way inclined. I'm artistically inclined. I can't do that tech stuff. What we do is to say, hey, you can. You don't have to be an engineer. We can teach you the very basics of electronics, where you will learn when people talk about the fourth industrial revolution and what's coming ahead. Uh, there's a lot of robotics. You know, the, the basic of it, uh, let's say we empower you with the knowledge of sensors and um, how to make things move and how to make things light up. And, and uh, suddenly you feel and how to do basic, basic uh, coding. People talk about coding. You and me would probably think um, we're not into that, right? But if we learn the basic idea of it. So these are skills and tools of the future. So the makers movement aims to propagate this idea of the democratizing of production through making tools available and the skills. Uh, you can walk into a, a fab lab, which is a digital fabrication lab, or make a space. There are a few in Jakarta. Jakarta Creative Hub is one. Uh, there's um, uh, the one industry further away and there's a few smaller spaces and if and if other parts of Indonesia so basically we're seeking to empower the individual innovation we spoke about innovation uh, usually it's producer innovation where the company will innovate what they think you need then came user-centric innovation where they produce what you thought um, they thought you needed now it's about consumer um, centered innovation means you produce that thing yourself. So let's say the, the new um, thinking of these communities, so these lateral governance, this, this um, uh, open everything, open innovation, open source, uh, is a kind of sharing, a kind of a getting together with education. You know, we're going to face a world where um, we need to ask vital questions on how knowledge can be used to empower people in an otherwise exclusive system and, and what it means to be alive in an age of contradictions. Moving forward, there's a lot of things to address. So, uh, on a very basic le uh, level, I'm um, propagating perhaps access to these tools, access to uh, making 
we need to get back, get our hands dirty. It is this whole um, uh, empowerment or confidence. Um, there were some very sad statistics we heard just now from uh, the, the deputy governor about just outside of Jakarta, kids are not getting um, education. Or these kids, given the tools, given in, if you intervene, the potential is amazing. I, I believe that everyone has the potential to be like a, a Harvard student. Or it is the exposure, it is the intervention that's needed, the education that has to change, the teachers that have to not do a top-down approach, but more like be like a mentor. It's, a, it's difficult, but it, 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 it has to happen. So um, I would, the reason why we're doing this is also to encourage uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs. They will be the job providers of the future. You may also solve your own problems at home. Very simple, um, you go away for two weeks, your plants don't get watered. With very, some very basic uh, skills that you learn at a fab lab or a maker space, you can create your own watering system where your plants will be watered or maybe a little um, sensor for pollution if you get the haze um, that comes once in a while due to all the burning of the forest, you have a pollution monitor. These things you can create yourself. You have a friend of mine became an inventor because he had to change the diapers of his uh, his baby, uh, his baby, and he created a kind of a warning uh, system when it gets wet. And so now people are there are communities who are accessing knowledge uh, information from the satellite on soil moisture. moisture. So and and it's communal knowledge. That means all of us own this handmade device, for instance, and we share this data on an open source platform and people can use this data. It's a different mojo, it's a different world of interconnectivity and I think we need to address this somehow because it, it actually empowers everyone, the grassroots, and, and it brings, we have to tap into and seed the potential of the other goldfish. Yes, we laud the success of the one goldfish, but we need to look and really, really take care of the people. And I believe one of the ways in which we are um, propagating is to uh, enable the tools, the skills, the expertise, um, and give them affordable access, and therefore democratize production and democratize innovation. I like that. I, I, I like the notion of democratizing production. You also mentioned that in terms of going forward, the, the, the future population will not necessarily be relying on uh, what I would call a formal education. If, we're mailing, if, if I can come back to you, you know, my understanding is there are some of the larger organizations like Google and even some of the consulting companies like EY are now reducing their reliance on degrees. degrees. So uh, perhaps if you can just give us a little bit of insights into how you see, in terms of what uh, Zaleha was saying, that her group is actually enabling people with or without a piece of paper being able to contribute meaningfully to the society. How do you see being an educationalist having come from years of teaching in top university in this country? Do you feel that maybe getting a piece of paper is a outdated? <laughs> about the piece of paper in Indonesia, it will still remain for a while at least. But uh, I hope that, you know, we, besides uh, what the digital technology and all that, I think the other word that's very important today is the whole globalization. With globalization and just the introduction of the global uh, knowledge that exists out there, Indonesia cannot be living in isolation in their hearts, okay? And what this means to me, I hope that the EYs that you mentioned, Google or so, when they recruit, that they also say, oh, you know, as long as you can pay, pass my test, you can enter. In the meantime, uh, you know, what, uh, when I wrote that book, what I was hoping for, and why I also accepted this, uh, opportunity is, I want to tell universities to change. And the change comes what uh, you are asking about is, why, is uh, why does it have to change? Because 
in a global world, everybody is competing for the same things. Uh, and one of the products that universities are competing for is the courses, okay? The study programs and the courses. But Jokowi, for instance, said 20 years ago, you know, the Faculty of Economics had three study programs and departments, and today it still has the three departments. Uh, economic development, accounting, and management, okay? Uh, so we're discussing, and Pak Jokowi was asking, what about digital economy, economics? Why is that not taught? So the discussion is still going on. But what is happening in the world, okay, and this is where I, I think the revolution will come from, and that is what we call MOOCs. MOOCs stand for Mass Open Online Courses. Uh, mass means, you know, there are no classroom walls, there are no uh, campus uh, boundaries, no country boundaries, but it's really open to the world. So, uh, one of the pioneers in this started a course, uh, he, is at, he started Udacity. He started a course, he was still teaching at Stanford. This is the one that really amazed me, that's why I cite him, uh, Sebastian Tran. Uh, he opened a course when he was still at Stanford, and he got, what is it, something like, uh, 180,000 applicants for his course from 130 countries in age ranging from 10 to 70 years. And then he said, what? With so many, he said goodbye to Stanford and started his own company to do MOOCs. Now, MOOCs now, and what Udacity is doing, and there's another big firm in, in the West Coast. This is, of course, around California and um, what is that, the, com the digital center there. Um, what they're doing there is really skill development. So AI, making automobiles, and that's very popular. On the West Coast, around MIT and Harvard, you have uh, what the, the company's name is edX. Here, at UE, we also have it with UE, ITB, IPB. It's called Indonesia X. It's a MOOC. It will make education far more accessible, also uh, democratizing it, because right now it's too expensive for too many. Enrollment of that age group, 19, 19 to 24, it's only 25% today. Okay, it's still very, very low in Indonesia. Uh, the vice governor said, you know, there is SMA, only 40% uh, haven't even gotten their high school degrees. It is still very low, so this is growing slowly. But at the high upper end, it's still very low. And what I think you're all talking about is really this elite class, though. Those who can read and write. Those who, can do, who have access to the internet. It's only those who will be able to benefit from whatever you're promoting. The, and the majority still doesn't have it. So what do I hope? Through this technology, if the government can expand the technology to give access to further outlying areas, and then not focus on, I think the children call them boring subjects, but more what you're talking about. Teach them a skill, what they will need to empower themselves. How do you make things? That is much more interesting. And then how can you sell it? Or who will sell the products? Okay. This will then be more interesting and really democratize education. And hopefully, maybe in the future, that's what I'm telling my students also. Don't worry, just do a MOOC and you can also get your degree. Thank you. Professor Meling, in fact, yeah. um, if I may ask Zaleha, if you want to add something to that? No, she was talking about um, yeah, getting degrees in education. I almost have a question. Actually, we have more questions than answers nowadays with everything changing so fast. It's also the nature of work. 
we talk about employment in the future. So what are the skills that we need to focus on? A lot that I read in education, it's about collaborative uh, problem solving or things like co-optition, it's cooperative competition. It's not so much individual, I'm better, I'm the best, but really leverage on, it's, it's still new, people are still trying to figure out how best to uh, have this kind of lateral uh, way of doing things and that actually benefits everyone and is more inclusive. So in terms of education also, the future of work, what kind of jobs are we talking about and what kind of skills do we need to prepare ourselves for these jobs? So perhaps if I can come back to Nico, given you are, you know, private sector entrepreneur, you are probably one of the, you know, a key employer of Indonesian graduates. How do you see if you have a bunch of people coming to you saying, you know, employ me, but I don't have a degree, but I've done mood. How, how do you, are you ready for that kind of level of, so you're hiring a person on the basis of the intrinsic skills, not necessarily a piece of paper. I think in today's uh, world, we are a little bit more open towards different kinds of skills, not only just uh, paper qualifications. We are quite open to see what kind of skill sets this person has and how can it match well to our requirements. Just to add to Professor Mailing's thesis yeah, on mobs and all that, I think as a real estate developer, it's very important to start developing products which would allow people to collaborate better in terms of studying, you know, and uh, what Zaleha has said on culturalizing technology, I think real estate developers has a very important role to play by creating the right ecosystem and uh, creating a real estate which would help to enhance, to make innovations much faster. And also, we also as real estate developers would like to challenge people in education industry on what would be the future universities should look like and uh, how can these universities be actually built in all our satellite CBDs which would allow people to collaborate, to meet up and to discuss things much faster much cheaper with technology. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you, Nico. May I perhaps if I open for questions? Rosmalia? Yes, uh, good evening. I'm Rosmalia, Rosmalia Daim Hartman. I'm with the Singapore Intercultural School, the CIS group of schools where we oversee to eight schools all around Indonesia. Now, it's interesting, everyone is focusing on higher learning and universities. Well, I'm representing a group of schools from nursery right up to junior college before they get into universities. And I can say, um, honestly, the issue starts from the foundational years. And if I can share with you a study that was made uh, by the World Bank in 2015, specific to Indonesia, and interesting, um, I'm posing this to uh, Hutomo and Professor Meritus Meiling. Um, when we speak of sociology, we've learned that 40% of parents in Indonesia has never met their teachers. There is a total disconnect between parents and the teaching and the teachers of, uh, of the schools that the children attend. 55% has once or never attended any school meetings. 65% never talked to the school principal and 90% has never volunteered in any school activities. We're speaking here of Indonesia uh, national schools and a study that we had made. And speaking of 21st century skills, which Otomo has, um, uh, has referred to, which is what international schools, and we are not the only ones, I believe all international schools in 
in Indonesia are now focused on 21st century skills, collaborative, you know, digital uh, uh, focus and, um, and a lot of uh, interaction. However, in Indonesian national schools, 74% of the interaction is purely teacher focused and 15% only is Indonesia. So the class time that is spent on lecturing, we had made a study, over 60% is a one-way track lecture. So from here, we've, we've addressed the issue that the, it starts with teaching. Yeah, um, the teaching issue is from its foundation years. Um, we at SIS are trying very hard to, to, to create a PPP, a PPPT, to, to drive, uh, to help out with the, in, to improve the teaching standards in Indonesia by mobilizing local teachers to, to come together with us international school teachers. But we can't do it together. It has to be, you know, uh, with the full cooperation of the corporate corporations in Indonesia as well as the other international schools in Indonesia. And that becomes a challenge. So my question back, um, what uh, San Diego Uno has, has addressed is true. Six out of 10 students in South Jakarta alone did not complete high school. So what can we do? We are a private sector. We try to help, but we get closed doors and shut out when we try to, to approach uh, larger corporations to, to come together with us to help raise the, the uh, teaching standards in Indonesia. Thank you. <laughs> that's a question that's very close to my heart. Uh, this is exactly why uh, I think changes have to occur in the ministry, in government, really. So if, we, if the Indonesia Economic Forum can be helpful to this, it's really where the changes have to start. Yes, well, the world uh, has moved to from a teacher to a student-centered learning methodology, uh, in most cases, we still continue because it's not that easy for us to change. And international schools cannot uh, be the engine of that. It has to be the government because of the role of government here in education is very great. So change can only occur maybe with the Indonesian Economic Forum, if this can be promoted to the government. You ha if you want uh, to uh, move the way the president wants it to move, yes, that's where the change has to occur in a ministry. Uh, I think, uh, Professor Malik, you make a good point. And um, while I recognize most Eastern cultures, the teaching method is one way. Um, I mean, we all have gone through similar teaching method of being uh, rote learning, etc. But so, while that that may be a process to change, but I, I recognize what Dibu Meling is saying is, if you take away the notion of education from a social obligation to an economic imperative, then you look at education in a different manner, all the way from preschool, preschool all the way yeah. to university where educating their people becomes an economic imperative, not a social obligation. Any other questions? Me? Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Sari Latif. Uh, I happen to be a university, um, a, a law student at Sekolah Tinggi Hukum Jentera. My professor is here. My question is, um, I decided to take a law degree or a degree because in Indonesia, the paradigm or the you know employees as employers are still uh, looking at that piece of paper or that degree to qualify you to get certain job or even certain standard of uh, salary now how do you change that paradigm because you mentioned uh you know it's just more than a piece of paper and how do we equip ourselves if you don't have a degree and how are you going to change like employers that that's not a, like a major issue in in terms of employing somebody um, you know, I come to Indonesia where I uh, grew up in Australia. Work experience is far more valuable than that piece of paper. And sometimes, you know, coming back to Indonesia, it becomes such an issue. Uh, you know, even though if you have a, you know, a employee, a employment degree, I mean, uh, experience. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I am equally to blame because we only hire from three universities locally. Um, we will change, perhaps send us a CV. 
<laughs> Perhaps if I can ask Nico to respond as a industry person. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it takes a little bit of time before we start to accept uh, probably like work experience to be one of a very important criteria. Yeah, because I think in, to, in Indonesia, most of the paper qualifications are still quite important. But I think we still take a small percentage of those talents which have the right experience but without those paper qualifications to be part of the company as well. You know, in Indonesia, the role of government is still very great. So, and don't forget that except for Jakarta, around Jakarta and other big cities, there are no other formal sector employment opportunities except for government. And for government, it's easier to base things on uh, pieces of paper. But hopefully, the private sector can introduce tests, which is what, of course, EY or Google or MIT does. That's what they do. If you pass the test, you can get the job. But that means this is uh, here to the private sector. My hope, my wish, my request to you is, do you know what skills you need? And can you tell the university what skills you, you require so that they can also change? Because we don't know what it is that the private sector wants. When we do our tracer studies, we're told, oh, your graduates know a lot of facts, but they have no soft skills. So what we talk about in the university is we better te teach our students soft skills. And now we're talking about something else completely, right? If it's skills, what kind of skills that do you, uh, does the business community need? What can universities produce? Because that is really where the future has to be. Thank you. Could I have a, a, a quick Please. comment on that? Um, if you are applying for a job in a law firm, yes, then that skill is required. But as a, uh, as a business, I have hired people who are based on more of their thinking and their character and what I see the future in them because I believe in, a, in diversity of you have different types of people in an organization you would have you'd be more productive because the, the ideas come from a different place like uh, i know in air asia uh, the customer relations for southeast asia he's a, a mechanical engineer who toured the f1 but he ended up uh, as that because it's, it's it's really i think when we hire it's about when you've got a degree you, the question is do i need to get a degree um, uh, to get a job. It really depends on um, uh, what, yeah, what <laughs> the job you apply for. You, you might be going more for a more creative job, would be more you know, accepting perhaps of, of, uh, of a non-paper. Well, I earn money without the degree right now. So <laughs> but yeah, but I guess if it's a law degree, yes, I understand that. But I guess in where it's going to be a free trade coming and the competition, not only with Indonesian with a degree, but also with the foreigners as well. So that kind of still a benchmark, I think, in Indonesia more than the Western world, that's all. Be an entrepreneur. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so if I may conclude, um, the prognosis going forward is positive. The realities are in the last three years, there's been consistent effort to not just talk about building infrastructure, but actually building infrastructure. And the other good news in terms of what uh, Ibu Meiling was talking about, enabling the outer regions of Indonesia to equally grow, the uh, government uh, currently is building uh, a program called Palapa Ring, which is basically installing broadband across the entire uh, country. And that broadband then enables everyone who has access to smartphones to be able to then use the facilities that comes with smartphone. Now, you may think a smartphone is something that is not achievable, but the reality is there are over 220 million phones in the country. 80, almost 42% of that 
is smartphones. So the access to the public is increasing. So can you please join me to thank the panel, um, Pat Nico from Pollux Properties, Professor Mailing, and Juan Nurizaleha from Barkaria. Thank you so much.